IT consulting firm here in Las Vegas as well as in Central Florida. And we work with uh, primarily healthcare and construction organizations. And so we're going to go over just some of the um, issues that we're seeing out there in the wild as the companies and healthcare practices are running into from a cybersecurity and technology standpoint. Um, I'm not going to make this a sales pitch. This is me. Uh, I like to spend a lot of time underwater every chance I get. Um, but uh, what we do, uh, I'm not going to you know, kind of go over this stuff. If you have any interest, uh, talk to me afterwards. And so just out of curiosity, what size organizations are in the room? So who here is in an organization over 200 employees? All right. And uh, under 50? Okay, so we're about half and half. All right. And uh, for those that have, are under 50, how many have their own IT staff? Okay, that's good. Because if, if you have IT staff and you have under 50, you're either paid too much or you have someone that has no idea what they're doing. So that's perfect. So, and, and who, who in the room is technical? Who has like technical knowledge? Anybody? All right. That's right, James said, uh, we're gonna be out giving you an offer. Who absolutely doesn't care about technology? Just doesn't want, doesn't want to hear about it. All right. So, here, here's the thing. Things have changed over the last few years. There, there are a lot of threats, and there's opportunities. The internet and technology has really made things a lot more efficient for everybody. You're able to have people work from home. Um, during COVID, a lot of people, a lot of organizations switched over to work from home, and that was, you know, allowed to continue functioning, but it created a lot of risk. And most organizations didn't properly manage that risk, and some got bit, and many continue to get bit. So the biggest thing is that there's no cybersecurity management practices at most organizations, even larger organizations. Um, you know, I was in a presentation with the FBI a few months ago, and they were talking about a police department that they had to assist in a re recovering from ransomware. They had all their servers and computers ransomed, and they didn't have any backup. So all the evidence systems, their payroll, their everything was compromised. And this is the decent-sized Southern California law enforcement agency that didn't have backup, didn't have anything to set up. Now, if it was healthcare, that's also a HIPAA violation. Um, just, I don't know if, you, if anyone wants to fess up to it, but who here has been involved with or has had ransomware within their organization? Only one honest person in the room. <laughs> So in 2021, 1.2 billion was paid to in the UN, in the United States to ransomware organizations. So that's 1.2 bill, billion that was admittedly paid. Now, paying a ransom technically is illegal in the United States, but no one's really getting prosecuted for it. But they may start pushing, you know, making that more illegal and actually enforcing. 6.9 billion lost in the U.S. through cybercrime. That's a lot of money. So, out of curiosity, anybody need a good job? The dark overlord is hiring. Only it's uh, starting at 63,000 a month, and uh, after a 90-day probationary period, and then after two years, you could be at one a little over a million dollars a year. Um, you have to be enterprise and cyber criminal, um, but they're hiring right now. Um, and that's actually a real, real ad from about a year and a half ago from the dark web. So who here has a good understanding of what the dark web is? Anybody? All right, we got one, one and a half. All right, so the dark web was, it was started for a good reason. It was started by the UN, by the CIA in order to allow co covert agents and dissidents in various countries to secretly communicate. And it's kind of turned into a little bit more. Um, you can't end up, you can't click on a browser link and end up in the dark web. 
it's not possible. So there is no, oops, you know, it's kind of like I tripped and I ended up on the dark web and ordered meth. Uh, <laughs> so if anybody in the organization gives you that excuse, it's not true. Um, you have to use a Tor browser, and there is no Google for the dark web. So, you know, if you want to find, you know, exterminator in Las Vegas, you go to Google, type in exterminator in Las Vegas, you'll have 4,000 results, and you can pick one. So for the dark web, you actually have to know where you're going. You have to know what you're looking for, and there's no way to search for it. You have to be invited, or you have to be told, you have to somehow find out. And what they're doing is a lot of it, the dark web is sharing information, sharing of techniques, but there's also marketplaces. And picture Amazon only for illegal things. So if you want to buy, let's say, first example, meth. If you want to buy a, you know, a pound of meth because you and your friends are going to have a party, you would go to a marketplace, you would look at the, out of the 50 meth vendors, you would find who has the best reviews. This is actually just like Amazon. The vendors are reviewed. And if you order meth from that vendor and you pay for it and you don't get your meth, you actually can file a complaint with the marketplace. And the marketplace will act as an intermediary. And so you actually have the ability to, you know, and, and they don't want to, if, they, if they've been doing, if they've been selling meth for a while in this marketplace, you don't want, no, they don't want to lose their status. And on there, it actually says how many complaints have been filed, how many complaints have been resolved in favor of the buyer, how many have been resolved in favor of the vendor. And so you don't want to have a bunch of you know, unresol you know, resolved complaints against you if you're a really good meth dealer. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, it's a stupid question, but what is a Tor browser? So it's, there's, you can download, there's, there's plugins for, there's the Onion browser, there's a number of Tor browsers. It's, it, without going too deep, it, it's a He's, he's got a message to Matthew. I am. <laughs> um, it, it's a different, it's, it's similar to a web browser, but the addresses are completely different. It's not www.whatever. It's long string of characters, and um, I, can, I can show you later. <laughs> um, but a lot of the time, if you're ordering something, um, you know, it, so if you actually were to, if any of you were to actually go to the dark web and go to one of these marketplaces and find your way to one of these marketplaces and say, hey, I want to, I want to buy two pounds of methamphetamine. They're not going to sell to you because they're going to look, your account hasn't done any transactions. You know, they might be able to sell you $10 worth and to see if you pay for it because they want to make sure they're vetting you so the buyers also have a rating. So it's kind of like Uber or any other, you know, if, you, if you're rude to your Uber driver, they mark you down to one star. And then after a while, none of the Uber drivers will pick you up. So this is very similar uh, on these uh, dark web marketplaces. The reason I didn't even bring any of this stuff up is that cybercrime has changed. Any of you in the room could get into the ransomware game, into the cybercrime game, even if you have no technical knowledge because these folks are willing to be hired. And there's ransomware as a service. So you give them the list, they provide you the ransomware, you send it out, and there's revenue share. So it's, it's real business. And they have tech support. So when you have a problem with your ransomware or with your whatever um, you know, malicious software you've asked them to write, there's a call center with 20 people that are gonna answer the calls. They're gonna help you, they're gonna fix the code, they're going to help you disseminate it, and they're sharing revenue with you. So this is why this is so prevalent. It's not just that there's a ton of people with skills that are nefarious. It's that there's a ton of people with skills that are nefarious, and they even even more people that want to take advantage of those skills and make money. So who are the targets? It's everyone in this room. Whether you're retired and just have family pictures, or multi-billion dollar corporation, they're after you. And it's a lot cheaper to infect somebody 
than to try to sell real products. Um, you can send out a million emails. If one tenth of one percent of the folks click on them, and you know, and even only one percent of those people actually pay a ransom, that's a lot of money, and your cost of goods is zero. So it's it's a serious serious issue, and people think, well, I've got a Mac, I'm safe. No, <laughs> you're not. Um, you know. Apple, but Apple gets compromised, maybe not as often as, as Windows, but there's just not as many of them. Um, so Apple's a target, Android, Apple, um, you know, the, the, you know uh, iPhones, and definitely Windows computers, and as well as Linux. So from a healthcare perspective, medical records on the dark web are like gold. Um, credit cards you can buy for about a dollar a card because credit cards expire. Credit cards can be turned off. How do you turn off or cancel a medical record? So what do you need to be able to see a patient to in a medical practice? You know, name, date of birth, address, social security number, you know, employer info is helpful, insurance information, responsible party info. What do you need to commit identity theft? About half that. And not to mention all the medical medical fraud that happens, and uh, you know how many billions of dollars does HHS send to uh, fraudsters? Um, but during COVID, I believe it was four hundred and fifty billion dollars was sent to Nigeria by the U.S. government, and no one went to jail. And for those that think that eh, not a big deal, there's a lot of small and large entities that are getting targeted and compromised. Uh, this is a fairly recent one, Neurology Center of Nevada. Anybody here know them? So they had 11,000 records compromised, and that's, that's here locally. And obviously everyone remembers UMC, and I mean, a lot of organizations here in town have been targeted in the past. You know, if you think you're small, you're an easier target. You know, who's, who's, who's a bigger target, Amazon or, you know, Bob's Pediatrics, who probably doesn't have the employee training, doesn't have the systems in place in order to really secure their organization. And typically when you get compromised, the bad guys might be in your system for two, three, four, five, six months before somebody even figures it out. So during that time, if they have free reign to look at information, Exfiltrated, um, you know, that, there's a lot of a lot of damage can be done. Um, not to mention the HIPAA fines afterwards if HHS thinks that there was willful neglect involved. Um, see so some of these statistics: ransomware attacks increased 10.7 times between 2020 and 2021. That's a lot. And one of the things that one of the biggest stats there, 80% of businesses that pay a ransom will get attacked a second or more time. Um, and the different statistic says that 26% won't change anything after they've been attacked. They actually won't do anything to prevent it from happening again. So it's kind of sad. So a couple of options, you know, in this current world. So you have a couple options. You can just lose everything, get ransomed. You can say, okay, I'm done. I'm going off to 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 call Cabo. Cabo. I just got back from Thailand. It's much cheaper to Cabo. You know, you can option two is you can restore from backup, and that may take a few hours, a few days, a few weeks. Some organizations are down for a long time. How long did it take UMC? Um, it was definitely over a week. That's a big big cost. Um, or you can actually have a system in place backup in place, procedures in place, a disaster recovery plan, where you know who within your organization is responsible for what to get you back up and running. And this is something that's missing from really probably 85% of organizations that we talk to, uh, both here and on the East Coast. And this is, as I mentioned, you know, it's, it's changed, it's now commoditized. Anybody can get into the game. You don't have to be an expert. You know, ransomware as a service and there's criminal gangs that sell this to companies that pay ransoms. Because if, you know, if you're willing to pay, because if someone doesn't pay, 
why go after them again? But if someone pays a good amount and they've got the money to pay, that's who you really want to target. You don't want to go steal from poor people, you want to steal from rich people. And the other, you know, the other thing that uh, I want to mention is that social engineering, so with the, think about within your own organization. If I were to show up and just walk through the door, and maybe I it, it wasn't wearing jeans, maybe I was wearing a full suit, and I walk in, hey, how you doing? And just walk toward the back and go sit down on the computer. Would anybody question me? Who, th who here thinks that someone would question me? Okay, everyone's honest. Um, so people don't want to be confrontational. Someone can walk in and they now have access to someone's computer that's, that was unlocked. Um, the other thing is that over the phone it works the same way. When you call, you know, most people want to be helpful. When they receive a phone call, especially if, you know, uh, hey, Joe, Joe told me to call. Okay, how can I help you? They're going to be a lot more receptive to you know, providing information that they maybe shouldn't. And unless they're trained within the organization, unless your staff is trained to, for what to look, look out for, they're gonna fall victim to various scams. So I'm assuming that you would be very suspicious of someone coming and asking you for that information in your office. Well, absolutely. Well, when they call my office, we have to verify that they're legitimate because we can't, hey, I forgot my password. Well, can you change my password for me? No. Who are you? Unless I know your voice, which, you know, at this point it's kind of hard to do when you know, we're supporting thousands of people. We're having to verify them. If they're sitting in front of a computer that we have access to, then we ask them to change the password. We'll type in a password, we'll ask them to change it. Um, if we don't know who they are, we're calling a manager because, you know, Companies like mine are really big targets because if you if you guys remember the Kaseya breach uh, recently happened a few months ago, or um, Solar Winds, half the government agencies were, were using Solar Winds software to manage their computers, and that was a serious problem. Um, who knows what China got? Uh, it, so that's something that you know we definitely want to protect our clients by, by protecting ourselves. But here's some. Fun statistics. In, 21, in 2021, 61% of attacks used people's hacked credentials. Who here is set up with multi factor authentication when they get in their email or in their other systems? All right. Looks like about half the room. Good. The other, they're good? Or? That, that's good, yes. No, that, that's absolutely mandatory now. If you don't have multi factor authentication, especially for email, that's, that's, the, key, that's the keys to the kingdom. If you get into somebody's email, you can read about how, what they're doing, where they're going, who they talk to, and how do they talk to those people. And then you can get in, into those conversations. Um, we recently had a construction firm that was doing a project for a large organization. Someone emailed the other organization was compromised. They sent an email with wiring instructions just in time to pretending to be my client. And they wired 500K to the backup. Now, is that a compromise? From a technology standpoint, that theft was non electronic, but the fact they were in the email and they were able to send the instructions from a fraudulent account, definitely because they were in the email. If they had never compromised the email, if there had been multi factor authentication turned on, they would have never known the transaction, the dollar amount who to contact, who to pretend to be. And this is happening constantly. Um, there's a lot of that, a lot of CEO, CFO fraud, where CFO of an organization gets an email saying, hey, I just found a new vendor. I need you to wire $250,000 to them today. And I'm getting on an airplane in five minutes. You know, send me an email when it's done. Well, does your organization have a process in place to verify that that's legit? because a lot don't. And once that money gets wired, especially if it's getting wired overseas, there's, uh, there's really no getting it back. If it gets wired within the US, it, if you contact the FBI within about three days, it's a good chance you're gonna get your money back. But if it's going international, you're, you're kind of so up. Um, and 94% of attacks are delivered via email. 
I mean, how many fraudulent emails do you guys get? I mean, it's, it's you know, 100 a day. So it's, it's, it's nonstop, and when you're busy, you get an email that looks legit, you're maybe willing to click on it. Well, you click on it, and you open a Word document, and it turns out to be kind of garbage, you just close it and delete it. Well, just by opening that document, you now have been made with compromise, depending on what kind of security software you have on your computer. Um, and training staff to be really vigilant is pro probably half the battle. I mean, you can buy all kinds of things to try to keep yourself safe, but ultimately, your biggest vulnerability is your staff. And every single organization, no matter how big or small, has at least one person, if not 20, that will click on absolutely anything. Whether it's from a Nigerian prince, or from, you know, you know IRS at gmail.com. And then you're thinking, okay, well, you know what? I have really good backup. If I get ransomed, I'm just gonna give them the finger, restore from backup, and be good to go. Well, that used to be the case, and they figured out a way around that. So before you get ransomed, they exfiltrate your data to the cloud somewhere, and if you don't pay, they then threaten to release that data and put it up on the web. So how bad would it be is if, if your patient data, or your payroll data, or other confidential information was suddenly published on the web? That probably be a little bit embarrassing, um, if not costly. So that's unfortunately, restoring for backup does not necessarily solve the problem. And then in the folks that have insurance, you know, we recently updated our policy with Wayne back there. Um, thank you. So, you know, who has cyber insurance? Or better yet, who doesn't have cyber insurance? And you figure, well, if we get ransomed, they'll take care of it, and we'll be okay. So in March of 21, it was a... What would the word cyber insurance cover if, if bad ransom is illegal? <laughs> so paying ransom, is, paying ransom is illegal, but just like paying ransom for, for kidnapping victims is illegal, but when you do it, no one's ever been arrested for it. And there's kidnap and ransom insurance for a lot of executives, especially people who travel overseas, people in the oil business. So similarly. So you can buy insurance with a ransom for it. Yes. Even though it's federally illegal. Correct. Okay. We have a couple of people who are So and but also cyber insurance takes care of other things. Uh, it's not just paying the ransom, it's also the recovery. It's, it's a lot of money for the forensics investigation. It's a lot of money for the recovery. Um, and then also the PR piece and potentially paying for people's, uh, you know, what do you call that, uh, credit, uh, the, you know, they're, they're, they're a year of credit monitoring, which by the way is totally useless. When, when the bad guys get your data, they don't use it right away. They wait three or four years to use it. So one year of credit monitoring is completely useless. But, so this was a three page, there was a three page um, add-on for cyber insurance in March of 2021. By September of 2021, that was an 11-page application. They're asking a lot more stuff. And the reason for that is not to protect you, but to protect the insurance company, because if they, don't, if they pay out too much, they go out of business, and they're not in the business of going out of business. So it's, the applications manage the insurance company's risk. And if you say that you do, if you check yes to one of the things that they ask, hey, do you have a backup? Do you check it monthly? You say yes, and then it turns out you've never checked it. Well, you've lied. So your insurance is potentially null and void. And if it's a substantial enough lie or omission, you don't, you're not covered. And also gross negligence. Hey, you, you did have antivirus software on all the computers, and you did have a training program, but two years, but then you stopped as soon as you got your policy. That's gross negligence. At that point, you it's like leaving your doors, unlocking your house and your car, and then calling the insurance company and saying, eh, you know, your auto insurance company will probably still pay, but the numbers are a lot bigger. And so Having insurance is great and it's important. And I think it's absolutely critical because no matter what you do, you still have an opportunity. 
you still have a risk of being compromised. And if you are, having insurance will help a lot. As long as you do the, the do, you know, your own due diligence and you actually do what you're supposed to do and what you said you were gonna do. Um, it's kind of like if you get a, a policy and you say, no, I do not skydive. And it turns out that you're a skydiving instructor. <laughs> when you die, you're not covered. Uh, yeah, life insurance just goes away. And you know, then there's for large organizations having DNO insurance um, would probably be is probably good because if you do, especially in public companies, if you do something that costs stockholder value, that's potentially illegal under Sarbanes Oxley. So some, some other things to consider. So yeah, ransomware payments increased 341 percent. So the insurance companies paid in, in 2020 paid 412 million. And I'm not sure what that number is now. Um, Wayne? Not exactly, but, but going back to your directors and officers, liability bar, that what we've seen over the last two years has been they effectively act as shareholders uh, and, and even on private companies. It's not enough to just go after certain, certain people. They are going after boards of private companies. Effectively giving on the meetings to the minute, the lawyers are going to talk on the meetings to the minute. Did they not have enough cyber insurance? They got hacked. It's the board's fault. You know, ten million dollar kind of on the number the board, and then going after you know directors, officers, personally. So it's it's, it's gotten bigger and bigger, and it's not just public companies. That's a good point, Wayne. So talk to Wayne about DNO insurance. <laughs> yes, sir. You know who is committing the crime, and you know what percentage of these people are apprehended. Are they mostly in the United States? Like, what's the nature of the, the perpetrators? So, a very big percentage of the perpetrators are nation states. So it's China, Iran, Russia. Nigeria. Uh, what's that? Nigeria. Well, Nigeria is different. They're doing more of lower end type crime, and they're also doing a lot of paperwork type fraud. Where they'll, they'll, they, you know, they'll apply for a PPP loan, they'll apply for, you know, various stimulus type things, um, and because our government is inept, they get paid a lot of money. Uh, but most of the what uh, is inept. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, so they're most mostly nation states, but there's also a lot of individual, you know, hackers. I mean, countries like China and Iran. I mean, Iran, probably North Korea as well fund some of their activities by stealing from, you know, by stealing from organizations all over the world. And, uh, you know, and a lot of that is they're stealing intellectual property, but also getting the ransomware game. And it also could be your neighbor's, you know, lazy kid living in their, in their basement. So it's anything from, you know, people within the U.S. and people from all over the world. But the biggest impetus is on these nation state actors and how are you going to arrest them? I mean the U.S. has warrants out for a bunch of Chinese nationals. They're in China. Huh. Um, we have drones though. What's that? We have drones. We do have drones but I don't think we want to get into a shooting war. Not yet. So, um, but yeah, we, uh, I'll, I'll skip the geopolitical stuff. I can, I can be up here talking about that stuff all day. Uh, but the main thing is that you know, payment, insurance payments have gone up tremendously. Insurance companies don't like that. So some insurance companies get out of the game. And what does that mean? The premiums are going up tremendously. Uh, Wayne, what was the typical cycle policy two years ago? Was it about 50% of what it is now, or? Oh, yeah, it's fine. I mean, you could use a basic cycle policy for around 5 million dollars. Yeah. Um, and it's and people are getting non-renewed. So you think you the I'm just gonna renew my policy from last year. Oh, my carrier, nope, no more. We're out. We lost too much money. Yeah. So so who you insure with and how well you manage your own risk is really critical. And so really you have to ask yourself, how compromised am I currently? You know, who's hundred percent sure that they are one hundred percent right now? Um, you know, it could be anything, your, your network, your data, your applications. 
Um, and a lot of us rely on third parties, that, and they're you know, third parties in our network. If you remember the Target breach a few years ago, um, that was where they, you know, they got compromised. It wasn't Target that got compromised, it was their HVAC vendor that had a computer plugged into their network that was managing, just controlling their air conditioning. And that system had a flaw, someone got in, and once they were in, they're on the physical network, and now they can spend the time to compromise the rest of that organization. So it really wasn't Target's fault, they just had the wrong HVAC vendor. And I mean, there's a, there's a ton of things that you really should be doing. But the main things I can say is, is multi-factor authentication is absolutely critical, and staff training is absolutely critical. Um, who has a training? Who, who has a training program here for their staff on both, whether it's HIPAA or and, and cyber and all those things? So, three quarters of the room, excellent. Um, so, and how many of those staff members actually take it to heart, or they grumble? So doing it once a year is probably good. Doing it on a monthly basis, having some kind of little drip campaigns, simulated phishing. Uh, like we do that for all of our clients. We'll send them fake phishing emails, and we see who clicks on it. And oftentimes it's the principals. <laughs> yeah, that's problematic. But that's something that you really think about doing because email is the vector for, for most compromises. And testing to see who, who in the organization would click on literally anything. And for those people, we can give them additional remedial training. <laughs> you know, there's a ton of policies that you need, um, but I mean, we're, yeah, this is not th that, that, sort of, that sort of meeting. Um, the one thing I can say is if, if you want to see if your organization is on the dark web with passwords, if you send an email to scans at htsfast.com, We'll run a dark web scan on your business domain and send you the results. Did you do the dark web? Well, yeah. Where do you think I get my math? <laughs> I like this guy. So it, that's something that because I've actually, you know, we we scan the stuff for our existing clients, and every once in a while I'll get a, uh, you know, I'll get a hit and I'll check, and it'll be the actual current password, and that almost always typically happens to be those organizations that have refused to turn on multi-factor authentication, which means I can get right in, which means who knows who else is getting in. All right, any questions? Yeah, we gotta have one from Dr. Calderon. What, what do you think? Oh, he is Yeah, 
No, that would actually that would be bad because then they would maybe try to target our clients more. So it's it really is a lot of there's a lot of negative, <coughs> negative reasons that you know, if someone gets compromised. We don't want our name associated with it. Any other questions? So with uh, Bruce still using his AOL account, you know, I actually got an email that I was elder abused. Somebody <laughs> making the AOL account. And I had to call in. I was elder abused. You know, I'm still amazed at how many high level people use AOL. No, really? I, it, it is, I mean, and we. So the problem is, if you're using AOL to talk to your kids and grandkids, no big deal. If you're doing transactions in AOL with AOL, that's a problem. Or or Yahoo or Gmail. Um, you know, I get these emails from vendors that say, "Hey, we can do all these wonderful things for your organization." It's from you know Susie Smith at gmail.com. Well, if you're not professional enough to even have a domain associated with your business, how am I going to trust you to do anything? But the bigger thing is that if you're in healthcare, you're sending information about patients to other practices, to other employees, and it's, you know, Susie dot, you know, Dr. Smith at gmail.com, and then she's sending it to, you know, Joe dot Dr. Smith at, at, at yahoo.com. That's just, one, it's not professional, but it's also not HIPAA compliant. Um, all those emails that have any patient information need to be encrypted, and you can't really do that in those platforms. So, well, it's not so much, so Gmail has a business platform as well, where you can have, you know, you can have your domain at, you know, but it's not gonna be at Gmail, it's gonna be at your company. And then you can add the encryption, you can add all the different features. Um, we like Microsoft better for healthcare, um, but, some choose to use uh, the G Suite, and, and that's fine. But it's, the, it's a professional version. There's a business associate agreement that's signed um, with Google or Microsoft. Um, so it doesn't really matter if you're using the web or you're using Outlook. Um, it's, it's still the same. And within your organization, if you're using something like, like a Google Suite for business or Microsoft, when you send an email from Outlook to another employee within your same organization, it's encrypted. Outlook, connection between Outlook and the cloud is encrypted. So you don't even have to use encryption within, you don't have to encrypt the email when you're sending it within your organization. If you're gonna send it outside, that's when you need to have email encryption. Yes, sir. Should you keep your insurance policies on your desktop? Yes. <laughs> Probably not. Loading for floating So that's actually, that's actually a good point. If you keep information about your insurance, on your desktop, and they look and they go, oh, this guy's got a million dollar limit. Yeah, let's go for it. Uh, as opposed to, you know, you got the, the policy that says declined due to failure to pay. That's probably deterrent to hackers. So if you don't pay your bills on time, you're less likely to be hacked. I'm just kidding. It, it, it's almost, it might almost be true. So that's a question that U.S. government has to ask about their own systems, but most organizations in the, U in the U.S. that are low profile, that are smaller, low profile, you, the goal is to not be low hanging fruit. So you know, if, if everyone in your neighborhood has an alarm system and a Rottweiler, and you have neither, whose house is getting robbed? So if you make it more difficult, if you train your staff to not be clicking on everything and not, you know, put submit payments to fake vendors to those types of things, you're less likely to be compromised because most compromises and most most of the stuff they're not targeting you. They're sending out a million emails to every email address that they can find, and they're hoping someone takes the bait. So if you don't take the bait. They're not going to then go, he didn't take the bait, so we're going after him. They have no idea who you are. You know, if you're targeted by China or Iran, you're probably going to get compromised. 
But why would they target you? They're just sending out this shotgun approach, and it's so easy to steal from so many people that literally will click on anything, that if you don't, you're much less likely to be a victim of, this, of these things. Okay, I'll All right. Yeah. You guys did a great job or a good job?